reflecting on this evening, I was aware that this is my 50th opportunity as a priest to preside at a midnight mass or 10 p.m. early uh, this year. 50 years. Oh, yeah, you. <laughs> If you live long enough, you get honored, huh? No, it, it's been a great 50 years. And what I often take the opportunity to do, and it's good for all of us to kind of reflect back on times in our life and, Lord, how you've been working. Maybe we saw you then. Maybe we look back and see how in the whole broad strokes of a life you've been at work. For me, thinking about that, I was thinking about early on, I was a, at a parish at St. Barnabas in Northfield. And uh, I remember I was in my third year, and I'll tell you why I remember the third year in a moment, in 1976. And, and it, was mid, it was the midnight mass that was truly midnight. And the pastor, who at that time was, six, 19, who was 67 years old, I remember thinking he was old. I don't feel that way at all today. It's all a matter of perspective. But anyway, I was up and I was out, and uh, it was kind of, I remember it was a cold night, it was snowy, and all of a sudden, it was probably around 11 o'clock at night, and this big truck uh, comes in to our parking lot and just parks off to the side. And I thought, well, I probably need to do something because the parking lot, there was gonna be so many people coming in, and all of a sudden, you had this thing, and by the way, what's going on there? So I went up to the guy and, uh, and I told him, first of all, I made clear I was a priest, you know, and uh, I just wanted to see what was going on with him. And he got out of the cab and we began to talk. I still remember this very vividly. And he said, well, I remember he was tired and he thought he needed a little break. I think he was long distance truck drive. I'm pretty sure he was going to Pennsylvania somewhere and coming through that night and looking forward, obviously, to getting home. And we talked a little bit and I said, well, do you know what this parking lot is? And he said, oh yeah, I said, that's, I'm here. It's a lot of space. But I said, I know it. there's a church there. I said, it's a Catholic church. And, and again, without pressing him, I said, uh, uh, do you know anything about the Catholic church or anything about that? And I told him I was a priest. He said, oh yeah. He said, I grew up, I went to Catholic school and, uh, but father, I got to tell you right now, I've been away from the Catholic Church for a lot of years. And I remember saying to him, well, you know, we got a mass coming real soon. We got a beautiful choir going to sing. It's going to be within the hour. I know you want to take a nap, and I understand that too, but what about it? And I remember his conversation, and I often, through the 50 years, get into those kind of conversations. He said, well, I don't think you want me there. And that struck me. I said, why? Why don't you think you want me there? Well, my life, yeah, I grew up, I was Catholic and all of that, but, you know, that was 20 years ago, and I've drifted away from all of that for a whole lot of different reasons. And, no, I, I just need to park here. And I said, well, you can do that. But I said, I'd ask you to really consider it and tell me why. I wasn't trying to press him. I said, why is it you think you shouldn't be here? And then he gave his litany of a number of different factors that uh, were very clear that, uh, hey, he hadn't lived the greatest religious and ethical kind of life up to that time, although overall he was a pretty decent guy. And, and he said, no, I don't belong there. And I remember saying to him, because I've said it to a lot of people through the years, and maybe you've needed to hear it too, I said, wait, why? Well, I'm just not that good enough. And I said, well, let's talk about the Christmas story. I said, it's going to go on in there, but I'll give you a sneak preview. And by this time, I was sitting in his cab because it was getting cold, and we were just talking. And I said, do you know the Christmas? Oh, yeah, I know the story, I said, you know. And, and I said, do you remember the angel? Yeah, the angels. And I remember saying to him, again, I've said it to a lot of people, to remember the story. We hear it now. But, oh, yeah, the, the, the angels appeared to shepherds. And how were the shepherds were? And then I kind of hinted and said, you know, initially they were kind of afraid. What's going on? 
And we basically talked further, and I said, think about this, because he's thinking, I'm not worthy, I'm not significant enough, I don't matter, I haven't lived my life perfectly, why should I be here for Christmas? And I didn't say it right away, but in my mind I thought, that's all the more reason to be here for Christmas. And so we talked about that, and I said, the shepherds, you know, the shepherds were not known to have the most ethical kind of lives. They weren't really that significant in their time period, and they, they probably did things that nobody wanted them around in the city. Just go out and stay in this country with shepherd the sheep. That's about all you're good for. That would be the mindset. That's about all you're good for, but do that. Don't bother us. And I said, it's the angels who appeared to them. They didn't say, oh, let's appear to the Pharisees. Let's appear to the significant Roman soldiers that are occupying this country. No, it's to the shepherds. Why? What's that all about? And, and we talked a little bit about that. And why were the shepherds afraid? Maybe because the angels are appearing and they go, well, these angels may know what we've done wrong. Are they, what, are they gonna chastise us? Are they gonna put us down? Are they gonna say, what are you doing around this place? No, they were proclaiming the good news because the shepherds needed to hear it, because the shepherds felt insignificant. The shepherds felt their life was probably somewhat messed up and, and they didn't li live like the regular people or the, the people that seemed to have it all going for them. And those are whom the angels went. And they, part of the reason, they were ready. They needed to hear good news. And so it was good news. Hey, this very day, one has been born who is a savior for you, for the world. That was another point that those, those shepherds at least knew they needed to hear good news. At least knew, yeah, I've messed up my life, starting with that, and then, hey, but you're telling me this God sends his son and loves me anyway and loves me even more? And the fact that I've messed up my life, that didn't compute with the way they grew up religiously because they hadn't kept all the rules and done all the ritual things. And so we see that, and I'm talking to this guy. I said, well, there's the story. There's the story. What about you? You say, oh, you know, your life hasn't been the best. That's who Jesus came for. For you, can there be some good news here? Or have you been listening to bad news? The bad news he heard throughout his life was a distortion of religion, maybe in his family or whoever, that, that again, he thought he had to earn God's love, measure up to God's love in order to have Jesus in his life as Savior. He had to have it all together. And basically, I was telling him, as I've told people for 50 years, all the more reason you don't have to have it all together. None of us do. And the fact is, that's when we, can be, when we realize that, and the good news is, hey, I sent you my son. I often say this, the one who loves us, the one who knows us best, loves us most. I told him that because I've been saying that for 50 years. The one who knows us best loves us most. This is the Jesus. He, Jesus knows what you've done and everything and loves you all the more. And I said, you know, maybe God didn't directly cause all this to meet like this, but I'm sure he's working through this and somehow. And at this time, the fellow was listening. And then I remember he said, well, you know, it's been a lot of years, and I know I can't go to communion. I know I'm not right with the Lord and with the church. And I remember saying to him, well, here's a starter. You know, and I said this kind of tongue-in-cheek, as I've said to other people, I am a priest. You know, there's a discount on Christmas Eve if you want to come to, to confession. You know, I'll give you a, a, you know, a discount for the penance. He laughed about it. Humor is often important. And I said, hey, I'm not here to judge you. We're sitting in this cab. No, guess what? You don't have to be in a confessional. You don't have to have the screen. I see you. I'm not going to think less of you, whatever you tell me. Well, then he opened up and we shared. And I also said about communion. He said, well, I haven't gone. I said, hey, communion is also not a reward because your life is practically perfect. No, communion is a gift. Christmas is a gift. Christmas tells us that God sent his son Jesus to gift us with his love, not because we deserve it, but because our God knows we need it. Our God knows that we need to be touched by that love, recognize we all matter, we're all significant. Whatever our past has been, 
Jesus says, it's here now, I love you. Let's go forward, I'm with you through it all. In fact, I've been with you through it all, through everything, and I've never stopped loving you. I often mention to people, Jesus never tires of forgiving us. Do we believe that? Or, off, or maybe the deeper issue sometimes is we don't forgive ourselves or let the Lord touch us in that kind of way. And so I mentioned to him, I said, communion, yes. Okay, yeah, you want to try to move in the right direction. You've, you've, you've mentioned where you needed reconciliation and healing. We all need it. And I said, now you can come. Are you sure? I said, hey, I'm a priest. I just got out of the seminary. I know that now come, come to the Lord. When you come to communion today, hear it, Jesus saying to you, thanks for coming. I've loved you all this time. I've wanted to be a part of you. I wanted to give you myself. Now you're hearing it. Now you're open to it. Let me give you love. It's not earned. It doesn't need to be. It, that Jesus was showing him and us in every generation, I'm there for you. There's nothing you can do to make me stop loving you except to close down and not be open to that love and mercy and goodness. So that made a difference in him. And I remember that uh, one of the most powerful memories for me, and I remembered a few of them on Christmas Eve masses, when he came forward to receive communion. You know, he was sitting in the back the whole time, and he came forward, and at that time you didn't receive in the hand, but he, he received and he, he came, and again, it was only priests that were distributing communion at that time. And he came, and I saw him, and I saw uh, you know, teary-eyed. But teary-eyed, I had seen that even when we finished our conversation. Not out of fear, not out of sadness, but out of sheer joy to know for the first time in his life that our faith, our Catholic faith, is most of all not about the rules and rituals. That has its place. It's good you're here. But it's most of all about relationship, relationship with Jesus. And then for him and for all of us here, right, for, to know we are beloved of God as gift, then hopefully that love, and we talked about that with him too, that love can touch us in such a way that we can't help but love other people similarly. When we know they mess up, when we know they've hurt us, when we know that they've done awful things, how do we choose to love and forgive? Part of the reason, I remember December of 76, was because two weeks earlier, I buried my stepdad. He had a rough life. He and my mom were separated. He had alcoholism. He had a lot of other issues. But in his last year of his life, I saw all the stuff he went through as a little boy in a very tough household. And I remember my mom and he and I, my mom and I both over that last months, because he'd been ill, forgave him for some of the stuff he did to us. My mom was able to do that. I was able to do that because I realized that's what God does for us. And I remember for the first time, my, my stepdad grew up in a very strict household in which uh, there wasn't much love there even from God. And I remember talking to him and touching him, and with, before he died, I remember him saying, Norm, thank you for loving me. I know I was difficult to love. And he also added, as we talked further, it was the last time I would see him, I didn't know that, thank you for letting me know that there's a God who loves me. That means so much. With that, he died in peace. So since then, you can see, I'm on fire, I'm passionate in any and every situation, and hopefully you too. Maybe you find the truck driver somewhere else in some other setting. Maybe you need to remember it for yourself and pass it on to family. God's goodness, God's love, he sent Jesus to make real clear how visible and tangible his love is for every one of us. To believe it, to experience it, to share it by giving his love to others, even when we have a hard time with my own love, our own love, and to pass it on. Thank you for being here tonight on this Christmas Eve. I think the Lord wants to speak to every one of our hearts and souls. Take a moment. What is it maybe you and I need to hear today and need to draw peace and joy from and need to pass on, maybe even tomorrow, with some people at family meals? Quiet moment. 
God loves us so much. Eucharist is the most precious gift we can receive. God bless you.